one of the main fun reasons for coming here is these light up microphones and it's usually I ask questions just so I can make it light up but they're not working so this will be it for now. So does anyone have a question? Okay, okay I'll be over in a second. Hi, right, thank you very much for your presentations. Um, my question goes in the direction of if there's so many genetic differences and there's one nose is not like the other, is it impossible to find a common language? So, I, I um, no, I think is the short, the short answer to that, luckily. Thanks. Uh, yeah, because you put all that work <laughs> into the flavor. No, because I, this always used to bother me when I was a kid. Uh, I was obviously a big nerd then as well. And um, the what used to really worry me is when I see the color red, is that the same color that you see as the color red? How do you know? Again, it goes, it goes back to this qualia thing. You know, the, the, the actual experience, the experience of seeing the color red may not be the same. What I see is red, you might see is green. But we can still use the same word, red, for both of them. And that and that's so through the magic of language. We can then we have something to, to sort of that we can communicate, and that's why I think that flavor wheel, for all my misgivings about how thorough it might be in terms of describing a, a molecular level event, is actually quite useful for describing a human level event. And the possibility for calibration, right? If you use the lexicon with the wheel and try the references, it's the same like the red example. The reference for one person for the blackberry jam might and will taste mm. slightly different, but you know what that blackberry jam tastes like for you, and I know what it tastes like for me, and we're talking about the same thing. Yeah. Well, thanks. Hey, uh, thanks again, both of you. But um, Simon, I'm just trying to get something straight about this recip. The zoo, so you talked about that we've got 400, right? For, you've got the genes for uh, roughly 400. You will have a different set to 400 than I do. Actually, we could probably go the genes for a lot more. Sure, but most do, of them do these nice. receptors correspond to one <laughs> species of stimulus? Or, or how does that work? Um, they recognize a certain suite of molecules, however they do that. So one receptor will be responsible for, for recognizing a certain suite of molecules. Okay, sure. And, and that's what you're trying to identify, I understand. Yeah. What, what they actually correspond to. Mm. Okay. Mm. But one more thing. In terms of the, um, the, the mucosa you were talking about, mm. what is the fundamental difference between the two, the olfactory and the other? The respiratory. Yeah. yeah, respiratory doesn't have olfactory sensory neurons and olfactory mucus. Well, there you go. Yeah. It doesn't have the nerves that it's... Oh, yeah. And when they generate, are they predictable? Or do they regenerate differently? Uh, so uh, that's a good question. We don't know. Uh, we think the current model is that it's uh, random in some way, stochastic, in that they just pick one, and because they know which one they've picked, they then know which um, uh, glomerulus to grow to. But how they do that is still on it. So theoretically, know. you could end up regenerating to a point where you can only have one type of receptor, theoretically. Yeah. 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 Cool. Just out of, yeah. But it's, a, it's probably the same chance as, like, theoretically, according to quantum physics, all of the air uh, at any moment decide to be just in one corner of the room. Sure, but sure. Thing. I just, I just, it makes me wonder how one's olfactory perception evolves as you as you grow. Yeah, well, it's, it's a mess. Because you've got all those things. Those, I mean, the nose keeps itself constant, because don't forget, the glomeruli stay the same, and the, and the, one, and the receptor-bearing neurons just know to grow to those. But... All the other things in the brain do change. So all the other inputs, all your expectations, all your the valences around it do change. Thank you. Um, hello. I um, have some question in regards of the lexicon and also the flavor well. Um, because when you're talking about Blackberry and you have a reference, I don't understand. And uh, I'm just wondering when you do that as a like panel, you find some panels. Do you do? Do you find people like across the world, or do you do it like just in America? And because when you talk about that blackberry gents, I we don't have that in Taiwan. And mm -hmm. just wondering because also there is Chinese um, SEA flavor well as well, and I found there is a uh, Vegemite in it. I haven't checked the Chinese one, but I wonder how you can. <coughs> 
it's late night for you, you know, have the communication. You said Vegemite or vegetative? Oh, that's very sick. Sorry. Yeah. Well, it's not just blackberry <laughs> jam. I'm just wondering. Okay. Good question. Um, well, when a, when a research study is being done and the train panel is using a lexicon or this lexicon, um, they will use it as is sort of in one location in one lab to find the answer to a certain question. I was kind of talking about us in the coffee industry using these references too to help us calibrate to what our respective blackberries are, right? It's true that a lot of the references right now that exist in the lexicon are North American centric because it was developed in North America by a few different sensory panels. But how it works generally is that once a lexicon is published, scientists and researchers from all over the world also use it. And in order for them to use it, they have to translate not only the language, the language is important, but we can translate the language on the flavor wheel, and it's very simple. Translating the reference means that the panels have to correlate a product in each region of the world where the scientist or another trained panel is working on that lexicon to the original reference. So scientifically, it takes a bit of time, as the lexicon will be used all over the world by different trained panels. Right now, the lexicon is not even published academically. It's still um, in review, I think. So once it's published, other research institutions or other universities with trained panels will want to use it and will use it around the world. And then there will be this literal translation where because they are human instruments, for example, you said Korea, right? Taiwan. Taiwan. You said Taiwan. So in Taiwan, if there's a panel that wants to work on coffee in Taiwan, they want to use that lexicon, they would be in communication with the scientists that actually published the lexicon, or they could obtain those original references and then match them to local products. And therefore, they would have a new set of local references that literally tasted the same. Now, this is a little bit weird because, um, you know, depending on the attribute, um, all the attributes aren't necessarily grown locally or found locally all over the world, but the beauty of lexicons is that they work on a universal scale. The sensory descriptive analysis is a universal scale thing, and that means that you don't necessarily have to have a blackberry jam for a reference for blackberry. There can be some other like local fruit, some tropical fruit, that the panel figures out matches the blackberry flavor from the original lexicon uh, reference, and they can use that. It doesn't have to be labeled blackberry. It just has to match the flavor. So that will happen. That's the long answer about the academics and the scientific realm and how they'll deal with that. How we're dealing with that in the meantime in industry is that the SCA is working on um, figuring out how we can create a simple, a more simple strategy to distribute this worldwide. Because we know that wherever you are, buying 105 different grocery items is challenging. So we're working on a solution so that hopefully we'll make it easier for the coffee industry to use references for this. Next question. Um, it's something we experience every day when we drink our filter coffee. Why, um, why does the flavor, why do the flavor and taste modalities change in intensity um, as the coffee is cooling? Well, I think Emma talked about certainly that we, we know that, I think the two things going on, the temperature, actually probably three things, the <laughs> temperature directly affects the perception of certain tastes uh, things, so this is why iced coffee needs to be much sweeter than than, uh, than hot coffee, for instance, uh, to keep the same sweetness as Emma was talking about. There's probably um, 
to uh, get those molecules up out of the coffee you need uh, volatility that changes with cooling so there are less uh, chemicals uh, released and then Emma also talked about habituation so this is this happens at multiple levels throughout the sensory system I mean certainly in terms of smell it'll happen at the at the receptor level at the uh, at the um, downstream level at the neural level in terms of the nerve itself at the bulb and probably in the brain as well so there's a whole the, the nose is very much um, detect, um, uh, a detector of novelty. It's, it's not interested in, in uh, really listening to, to smelling new uh, old things. It's constantly scanning for, for updates. <clears throat> How close are we? <laughs> How close are we from being able to get a machine to do this better? <laughs> To do flavor perception? To, what do you to, mean? To, to be able to taste, to be able to assess the, the molecular composition of the cells. Can do that. To deduce taste attributes. You can do that. Uh, we are doing that slowly. If you're talking about coffee specifically, which maybe you are, um, it's it's definitely an area of work that that needs a lot more study. We. World Coffee Research, who developed the lexicon, their sort of next step with that is to create a large database that can correlate chemistry with those flavors. Um, coffee, being so complex, is a challenge that way because even if you have the same exact coffee year to year, you know, from the same hillside on the same farm in the same country, uh, it's going to change. So there needs to be a lot of data collection to put something together like that, but it's definitely in the long-term plan as we would like to get there. I don't know about other other products maybe. Yeah. yeah. So you can you can tell the chemical composition by gas chromatography and, and spectroscopy. We have ways of telling how many molecules of X are in there. What we don't have is a way of correlating that with perceptions. Maybe because perception's difficult in all sorts of ways that we've we've gone through this evening. Uh, there are people building e noses, who are trying to um, electronic noses to do exactly that to try and um, basically mimic the human nose and the way that we understand and perceive molecular um, identity. Um, but you know we're a long way off. Yeah. But on the on the analytical end. If you have a trained panel at a research institute that <clears throat> is evaluating a lot of coffees all the time, and they they use half of their coffee sample to evaluate uh, sensorially, then they hand over the other half to their neighbors down the hallway who do analytical chemistry. They can start, this is the database thing I was talking about, they can start to understand which chemicals are associated with which flavor attributes over time and it is a bit of a theoretical goal for us to one day point to one compound and say well that means that it tastes like this and that means the genetic situation of the plant is like that but in theory with enough data one day one more hit um, they were very interesting talks, thank you. I just, mine is not a question, it's uh, three comments in relation to what's actually being said tonight. Um, one of my colleagues spoke at one of these previous events, um, and I just wanted to first of all pick up on your term of glycol, um, because that is a discrete attribute, and is already available in the form that people can use um, in small capsules. Where you deal with products like ferment in coffee, you're dealing with multiple chemical compounds. And when those are properly mapped, and that when might take a long time, but when they're properly mapped, then you can produce a capsule of that as well. Um, so it's not so far off. Your comment about uh, e-noses and e-tongues, um, there's a lot of work trying to match the sensorical with the analytical at, at, at this stage. and. Um, Finally, uh, you talked about fifth, fifth sense. Um, we've been doing a lot of work with the sense uh, for the last year, 
and we're currently running a, a test which I thought you might be interested to know. Um, it's with Fifth Sense members and we're sending out to them blind capsules uh, where they try to identify what they were. You know, it's a, it's a, it's a proficiency system and it's a test at the moment to see how good their abilities are to recognize different, different flavors. And it's all for the positive reasons that you actually said. It's to help them understand that how bad is their anosmia? Is it in a certain flavor range? Are there certain flavors they can still pick up? And can they pick them up at different intensities? And we're just at the point of starting to review that. So Duncan's coming into our offices uh, next month just, just to go through the first set of results. So I just wanted to let people know that there's quite a lot of active work going on. The Fifth Sense organization, considering it's only or well, roughly 18 months going, is, is a fantastic team. Someone from the middle. I haven't been up to the middle yet. Anybody? Quiet. All right. Take her uh, Okay, I have two different questions. They may be related, I don't know. You tell me. Uh, first one is that I, I get it a lot from my students that uh, does anything other than uh, aging can affect our sensory ability like smoking or uh, using spicy food and also so, some people are used to like different kinds of food like uh, like Indian people like spicy food like and does it affect how their uh, their per perception of uh, what they you know get from the food <laughs> so, uh, so, to start from the beginning, so yes, uh, there's there's evidence that uh, smoking almost certainly affects your ability to smell, and not in a good way. The, bizarrely, there's a population survey in um, um, Madrid which showed that Spanish people don't, aren't affected by their smoking. I'm not sure whether the Spanish people just <laughs> claim they're not, but that's the only one that it isn't. But most studies have shown that if you smoke, your olfactory sense is, is poorer. Um, what was the, uh, your, the cultural, uh, cultural for, for sure? I think I think that's very that's very clear. I mean, I, you only have to smell a durian to to know but that. Is it related is it to the memory or the olfactory senses? No. Ah, so that's a, that's a good question. So uh, I, I would say that is that uh, in the brain with the um, translation from the orbital frontal cortex and and, and um, impingement on the piriform cortex. Or is it something to do with the receptors themselves or the olfactory sensory neurons? We don't know for humans. Um, one, some of my colleagues at the Sanger Institute in Cambridge are looking at this for mice uh, to see whether if you are brought up in an in a environment where you're constantly exposed to something that you know stimulates a certain receptor, are you more? do you grow more of those receptors or do you grow less? The preliminary data as of last year uh, says that it doesn't seem to make any difference uh, if you look at the, if you look at the whole um, the whole mouth or main olfactory epithelium uh, it doesn't seem to make a difference but it may be that you you can build structures within the brain that are more sensitive to the same signal so it's not an upregulation of your receptors but rather that you you become more sensitive interestingly there's also some data that if you ha eat spicy food as a as a high spice diet you have a lower pain threshold, bizarrely. Lower? Yeah. So it was noticed by an obstetrician who had a lot of Mexican patients, and they always seem to be in a lot more pain during childbirth. <laughs> um, I have a question, actually. And mm -hmm. um, that question is, um, you gave us a model of smell um, with the uh, receptors, and you didn't go into how we smell exactly, <laughs> which is <laughs> super interesting. Simon is very connected with a guy called Luca Turin, who's... Is it safe to say controversial still? Yeah, definitely. In the world uh, of yeah. smell, but look up Simon's papers, look up Luca Turin's work, and get lost in a really fascinating world of how we might smell. Um, but the, one of the things that I was thinking about is in our industry, we're very required to verbalize smells. And the whole lexicon is based around being able to think of the word for the smell. And your model implies, I thought, that we are all recognizing the smell. So where is the block between being able to come up with the word? Is it a linguistic block? Is it a brain wiring block? And do we know where it might be? I, th I, think, I think it may be a cultural block in that we don't have a lot of attention paid to, to in, 
English or Western culture to the sense of smell. This is my theory. Um, so we don't have, we're not working on our own personal lexicons all the time. And since I've started researching smell, uh, which may have happened to you when you started being interested in coffee, my own personal lexicon has become a, a lot wider, um, but it's still rubbish. I, I, I think also that, don't forget, we talked about the receptors, 400 approximately active receptors. Um, each one of those can uh, be stimulated by lots of molecules, but lots of molecules can also stimulate different receptors. So the, the combinatorial, uh, the combination of 400 to the power of 400 is something astronomical. I mean, the number of patterns just by combining two receptors. And so, I mean, maybe that the search space is just too big for the number of words we have. Thank you very much. Okay, um, I, w I think there are many more questions, but I think we do have to call it a day for, for time reasons. Um, I should just say, please drop off your future subject forms to me here when you've done them. Um, we have lots of beer and food at Caffeine that will not get drunk. If some people don't upgrade their tickets, you may still upgrade. Go on. <coughs> Three objects or all of them? No, just do your top three, otherwise uh, my brain will fire when I try to edit that. Um, yeah. um, I'd just like to say a thank you to our volunteers who did all your samples, did an absolutely fantastic job getting everything set up. These three here, hands up. Absolutely super big thank you to Emma and Simon, one of our great nights, I think. So, a big hand for them, please. Okay, you're going to caffeine. I'll see you there.